what these items really are. On a day 150 years ago, some men with axes gathered by a pine tree. And uh, the pine tree, we are told, was a very large one, one of the larger pine trees to grow in the county. That meant it was very large because in the virgin forest of this county there were some extremely large pines. We are also told that it stood in what is now the yard of the castle here in St. Louis. I would uh, suggest that this pine tree was probably uh, somewhere around four to five feet through. The purpose of these men with their axes was obviously to cut the tree down and they did. And I don't know how many strokes it took before the tree finally fell probably plenty. And after the tree was down, they measured off a section of it and they chopped through the trunk again so they had a large piece of the lower part of the tree. Then they began to shape it and they began to dig out a big trench in the top of it and before long, although it probably took days, they had what even the most rank observer would recognize as a dugout canoe a very large dugout canoe. The purpose of this canoe was uh, to go down to the Twin Cities, the Saginaws, and get supplies for Trader Jacob Wilden's store. He was a German immigrant who had built a store probably in the vicinity of uh, the Conery Jan's Pizzeria building. And he was running low on merchandise because so many people had moved into this village and in the surrounding area. He needed to go down to the Saginaws and get supplies. Now, he could have been rash enough to take a horse, a team of horses, and a wagon down through the forest, but that would have been foolhardy. He would have been mired in mud in no time. And so it was for his use that this huge dugout canoe was made. It uh, was, when they finally got it fashioned and it was ready to go, they painted it red, and how they got it from where they cut it down to the river, I have no idea, but they managed to do that. It was named in honor of his daughter, Susan, and so it was popularly known as the Red Susan here in St. Louis, which at the time was called Pine River. And the Red Susan with a crew of men went down the river system to Saginaw, it loaded up, and then they pulled this large canoe all the way back to St. Louis. It was loaded with three tons of goods. That's right, three tons. It would, it would float that much. And of course, by taking poles and pushing, they made their way up the river system and came to the bend down here, moored the large canoe, the Red Susan, to the bank and start carrying the goods up to the store. I mention, uh, tell a story of this canoe because uh, some people might think, well, that's really cool, you know, that they thought of to make a canoe. Well, we know that canoes were being used on the river all the time, and probably not very many birch bark canoes because there weren't very, very many birch trees or trees that you would make that kind of canoe out of. You had plenty of pine trees. And so making a dugout canoe out of a pine tree, which will float high in the water, just simply made sense. They simply had a huge version of what was commonly used on the Pine River, and if they needed advice, they could simply go downstream a mile and a half to the village of the Chippewas and ask for some help. So the society has this wonderful canoe, which is probably the regular size compared to the enormous Red Susan, and it's pretty rare because of its quality. Uh, this canoe is exceptional. I've seen the one down at Saginaw at the Cushway House, and it's okay. And I've seen the one at the Wisconsin Maritime Museum in Manitowoc, and very frankly, people, it's a piece of junk, but at least it was a dugout canoe. And this one that's here in St. Louis is probably the finest one in many, perhaps many states. This is just exceptional. So, uh, when you take a look at the dugout canoe, uh, take a look at it with full appreciation of its rarity and its quality, and um, that it was, it was probably used around here. I don't know what happened to the Red Sioux. I do know that the trader, uh, the store owner, Jacob Wilden, sold out in a couple years and moved away. 
Not all travel went by river, obviously, and there were some trails that developed between Saginaw and St. Louis, and between St. John's and St. Louis via Maple Rapids. These trails were really terrible. In the spring and fall, they were mainly mud holes, um, and if you came by a carriage or wagon, chances are you'd have to move off into the woods somewhere and try to get through and avoid the mud. Uh, the rest of the year, they were just simply rough. And when they put stagecoaches on these trails to bring people into St. Louis, uh, and the stage ran several times a week, uh, people didn't come by stage to St. Louis unless they absolutely had to. The travel was so rough, and people got jostled and thrown around against each other in the stagecoach. They complained about this incessantly, but some people did have to make the trip. They tried to improve the trails, and they did to some extent, but they really weren't that great. And uh, finally, in the late 1860s, uh, St. Louis people were overjoyed to learn that a company had been formed to build a plank road from Saginaw to St. Louis. This was a good sign. And it was particularly a good sign to all those travelers who were now coming to the famous mineral springs seeking help from, uh, with all the various diseases that the magic water uh, was supposed to take care of. And these people were desperate, and they would take the rough stagecoach ride if their health could be improved. Well, a plank road is a lot smoother than a rough trail, and so uh, this was a very big excitement in St. Louis. A plank road is made like this. First, you go to the state and get a charter, and the charter says, yeah, you can build the road, but you have to maintain it, and it's bridges, and there were a bunch of rules, but you lay down stringers along the road lengthwise, as many as you need, probably pine and oak, the woods that won't rot right away, and then uh, you start sawing planks. And you usually have a sawmill handy uh, virtually on site, and you probably move the sawmill along as the road progresses. And so they would have started in Saginaw, they would have bridged the Titabawasi River, and then they would have continued to cut plank after how many planks was it going to take Put across these stringers to come as far as St. Louis. It's going to take a long time to cut that many, get them nailed down. The road had to be wide enough for two uh, horse-drawn vehicles to meet and pass. And once you had them down, they only lasted for a few years. I mean, a plank road was constant maintenance. And that was part of the charter. You had to keep it up and then keep it in good repair. And the planks would warp and they would pop up and then they had to be nailed back down. But it was better than a muddy trail. And people were very excited as the plank road gradually came closer. A plank road was a toll road. And the plank road between Saginaw and St. Louis wasn't anything unusual or you know, particularly new as far as plank roads go. A plank road had been run from Flint to Saginaw. That's quite a distance. I think eventually it became the Dixie Highway. And so this plank road is just one of a number of plank roads which were at that time the latest thing. And uh, so the people watched as the plank road got closer and closer. Well, you paid a toll, just as you do on some uh, of the interstate highways or the superhighways, in order to use the plank road. And at different places they had gates, uh, toll booths, uh, where you would pay for the privilege of going on the road. And you paid according to what you had. Uh, if you had just a horse and a rider, yay much. If you had a horse and a carriage, a little bit more. If you had a team of horses and a wagon or a loaded wagon, even more. So the plank road was funded through tolls. Now, in St. Louis, the toll gate was out on the east side of St. Louis at uh, what is now Croswell Road by the stockyard where you turn to go up to the prisons. And uh, part of the original toll house is still there at that intersection in the house on the northwest corner. That was originally the toll house where the toll keeper lived and uh, kept track of the travelers on the road. Now the house has been remodeled so many times that probably it has some of the original bones of the house in it but nowadays it would be hard to look at it and say, oh, that was a toll house. You would have no clue. Um, I found out somehow, I don't remember even how I found out about it, but I thought it was pretty remarkable. And uh, they would have a gate that they could close if they wanted to and open uh, to allow people onto the plank road heading east. But they also had a toll booth. 
where somebody would sit during the day and as travelers came along they paid their